Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. Good? All right. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, libraries in this century. And the problem tends to be that the specter of libraries in the 20th century continues to haunt the 21st century libraries. But what's easy to forget is the 21st century is already 10% over. So it's time to stop thinking about 20th century business models in the way that things have always been. Uh, as we'll talk about over the, the next few minutes, um, the book industry has never faced a uh, disruptive technology since the days of Gutenberg, which means nobody who's alive today has lived through a disruptive moment to book publishing like we're living through right now. So part of it means most of our assumptions, most of the things we hold dear, uh, the things we want to be important to our communities, it's all up for grabs. And things are happening extremely quickly. And the other part to remember is, you know, there was, we all can understand the impact of the Industrial Revolution on the planet. Well, this is the information revolution, and it's barely begun. It's not over. It's barely begun. You ain't seen nothing yet. And as we talk about some of the things that have happened so far in the, in the ways that libraries can access book, I think we'll be nostalgic for some of today's problems in five years. So with that bright, sunny note, let's talk about my personal opinion, which is libraries are screwed. <laughs> Now, did, uh, can you raise your hand if you watched my talk on YouTube about this? Okay, excellent. So I'm going to go over a little bit, just a few slides from that talk. It is available on YouTube. I'll, I'll give it a link later. But, and then I'm going to talk a lot about solutions and ways that you could address these problems, what your libraries should be doing now to address these problems, and what you should be thinking about doing later to address these problems. So the reason that libraries are screwed is because we are invested in the codex, <laughs> not print, the codex, right? the bound book, right? And when you're heavily invested in a media format, when that format becomes outmoded, you get screwed. Now, I want to make a big distinction because I'm going to refer to this a lot. There's a big difference between obsolete and outmoded. An obsolete technology is one that's been replaced by a completely superior alternative. Books are not obsolete. You know, uh, when the power goes out, that's abundantly clear, right? <laughs> Books are not obsolete. There are things that they can do that no ebook can do, like, you know, not require power to work and be able to just kind of be accessed without any other infrastructure to support them. However, books have become outmoded. Outmoded means replaced by an increasingly convenient alternative. When a technology becomes outmoded, it doesn't matter whether or not it's obsolete, its use declines dramatically because market forces primarily work on convenience. The more convenience a content format is, the more heavily it's adopted and used. And the book has undeniably become outmoded as a result of ebooks and print and the web. So, this is a problem when your organization is in the business of owning and sharing content because the new thing cannot be owned or shared. You cannot own an ebook. Nobody will sell you an ebook. You can only license an ebook. A license is a legal instrument, a contract that you make with the rights holders. When you download that thing, you are agreeing to the terms of the license. If you don't abide by the terms of the license, you're in breach of contract. That's not copyright. That's a big thing that people get hung up on is, oh, the copyright, the copyright. It's not about the copyright. The license can say whatever the hell it wants. And if you said, okay, then you agree. Then you're on the hook for it. So the catch is you cannot buy an ebook. You can only license it. They can't be owned and they can't be shared, right? Because the license says you can't do it. You know, now everyone knows there, there are some libraries that are circulating Kindles, right? You load up a Kindle, you circulate it, all that stuff. If you talk to Kindle sales, if you talk to Amazon's sales unit and you say, can we circulate a Kindle? It says, sure, why not? If you look in the license, it says for individual use only and the ebooks that you buy from the Kindle store may not be lent. The only thing they have is they have their one thing where you can trade a book 
right? The, the, the Kindle Lend, where you get to lend your title one time to one person for two weeks during the entire time that you own it. <laughs> it's nice that Amazon's magnanimous on that one. So this is a problem when your organization is in the business of owning and sharing content, when the content that people want cannot be owned and cannot be shared. That's a big problem. The other part of it is, when you're invested in a format, the more heavily, invested you're in the, more heavily invested you are into a format, the worse you get screwed when that format inevitably becomes outmoded. And you can ask any library that circulated Laserdiscs <laughs> if they had that experience. Now, fortunately, there weren't too many libraries that circulated Laserdiscs because, you know, it was the hot new thing. It was a fad. We knew that was a fad, right? We knew that that wasn't going anywhere. But there were some libraries that had a Laserdisc collection. You know why? Because they wanted to be innovative. Right? Well, that didn't work out so well for them. So when you think about content and when technologies become outmoded, you have to realize how quickly a collection of that stuff loses its perceived value. It doesn't lose all of its value. It loses its perceived value. And that's the most important distinction of as always we have to think about in libraries is perception is what matters. Reality is insignificant compared to perception. And if the perception of your community is that the library is not providing a good return on the tax investment, no more library. And you think that, you know, it's, it sounds like a scary story, but in Michigan, we have a library where this has already happened. The city of Troy, through a public vote, decided that they weren't going to have a library anymore, and it's closing at the end of this month. Forever. Now, maybe you'll come back someday, but they had a petition. They had all the library fans. They all signed their name. They took it to city council, and city council says, this isn't binding. The public voted not to fund this anymore. We can't go against the will of the people. It can happen to you. So just keep that in mind how, how tenuous this is. The other part is, the faster the content format changes, the faster you get screwed. Okay, this is Lost in Translation, which everyone, you know, that's a great movie. Everyone loves this movie. It doesn't matter how good the content is if it's locked up in a format that has become outmoded. When HD DVD lost the next generation wars, this was, this was the alternative to uh, Blu-ray. When HD DVD lost out to Blu-ray, the value of HD DVD collections collapsed overnight to the point where here's a great movie in a high definition digital format, brand new, shrink wrapped, and with an hour left to go on the eBay auction, it won't even get a dollar bid. It's worth nothing. Its value has collapsed completely because there's a perception that it is valueless. If you, and there's just not enough people out there with HD DVD players, they probably are already have a copy of Lost in Translation. It's kind of similar, uh, uh, if you'll permit a small digression. When Atari, got the license for Pac-Man for the home Atari system. They made 10, 000, 10 million Pac-Man cartridges. The catch was, they'd only sold 6 million Ataris at that point. <laughs> they were so sure that that system was going to sell more Ataris that they made more of them than their, consumer, than their installed consumer base. You know, and it's funny, because it's like, Atari was a really big deal, right? Well, at its peak, there were 8 million of them. You know how many? Uh, here, let me visual aid. You know how many of these things there are, Nintendo DS? There's 150 million of them in the US alone. And that is more than any other individual device. It makes the iPhone look like a joke. Anyway, di digression, sorry, my passion's diverted me. All right, so here's the big problem. This is the brand of the library, the book temple. Right? <laughs> and that's, you know, come to the book temple, worship the books. Do so with quiet reverence. Ask us nicely. Be well dressed. Don't smell. These are all of your things, you know? Don't make us do this thing, you know? We will. Don't make me use it. So, what, even though everyone inside libraries know that books are but a portion of what we do, the brand perception of libraries is the book temple. And we might as well be the Laserdisc temple. Right? Because the book has become a less than ideal way to access it. Now, you, you will always hear, oh, I love the feel of paper in my hands. I, I love the smell of the book. Well, if you consider an inhalation of mold as a critical part of the book reading experience, you're entitled to your opinion. But we need to remember there is a finite supply of such minds. Right? It's not something that a 21st century kid thinks. 
They're like, this stinks. Why are you reading this? It smells bad. So when this is your brand perception, you need to really think about how you make that transition into the 21st century. Our entire buildings are dedicated to this. This is the Liberal Memorial Library in Liberal, Kansas, and it's not a memorial to liberals. It's called, <laughs> it's, it's the city of Liberal, Kansas. And if you're not, it, when you build your entire buildings around this and shelves that are built in and elaborate systems for sucking in physical materials and processing them through conveyor belts and all that kind of stuff, well, if the interest evaporates in those physical items, your memorial library becomes a library memorial. We don't want that to happen. We need our organizations to stay vibrant. Here's the big way of thinking about it. And as I mentioned, print has never faced a disruptive technology event in the past 500 years, okay? So none of us have any experience with it. But we have experience with repeated disruptive events in the music business, okay? Now you can't say that music and print are that different. People buy them because they want to consume this stuff. Uh, if anything, print wishes it had this size of an audience, okay? But to look, these are adjusted $2011 per capita. Okay, so this corrects for inflation and this corrects for population growth. You can see the peak of the vinyl industry in about 1978 was almost $63 per person, including the nascent cassette industry. Now, who knows what happened in 1978 to make that thing start going down? Disco. Disco killed the LP. Disco was so bad that the entire industry was like, wait a minute, all this music sucks. We don't want any of this. And look at this precipitous decline. And it wasn't until the mid-80s when new age and shiny silver laser-powered things came in that the business started picking up again. But look at that vinyl business. Shrunk down to almost nothing. Now, now vinyl is growing 100 to 200% a year, but on bupkis. You know, their, their sales are something on the order of uh, I think they went from a $2 million business to a $20 million business or something like that. It's, it's a niche. And most tellingly, there's nobody involved in the vital industry who wears a suit to work anymore. <laughs> nobody. So when you think about this, after the bubble bursts, it collapses down to nothing. Look at CDs. Now you can see the peak of that in about 2000. We all know what happened in 2000 that killed the, vinyl that killed the CD industry, Napster. Right? So there's the Napster disruptive technology moment, and now it's fallen so far that here is the most recent data in 2009, CDs are selling about as same as eight tracks were at their peak, <laughs> right? And nobody liked that format. You know, you can see it had its little burst. So what is important about this is that we learn from this, from these technologies that have been disrupted, that when a technology becomes outmoded, the industry that produces it collapses by two orders of magnitude. It becomes 1% of its former self. Can you imagine libraries in a world where the publishing industry is 1% of the size that it currently is? It could happen. We'll find out more as we go about it. The other piece about this is because of Napster and because of all these 21st century whippersnappers and their free culture movement, digital is not making up the difference. Not even close. You know, I mean, this was the heyday. That was the golden moments, even now, with how much money is being made on digital. Now, the difference is, there's a lot more margin in this slice, because they're not printing or shipping anything around. But still, that's about, that's less money than they were making per capita on eight tracks back in the day. So keeping that in mind, let's think about the most obsolete technology you can think of, right? A candle. It's completely obsolete. It's messy, it's dangerous, it's unreliable, it's susceptible to a, you know, even a three-year-old can blow one right out, right? And yet, there's not a single three-year-old in the world who doesn't know what they are. And you hear people say, oh gosh, who's going to even remember books? The 21st century kids are not going to know what books are. It's bullshit. Everyone's going to know what a book is, just like everyone knows what a candle is. And they're probably going to use them about as often as they use candles. A couple times a year, special occasions, on your birthday, those kinds of things. Because that's the role of candles in our society. It's about experience. It's about romance. It's about ambiance, atmosphere. You can envision a book that has that role in our society. 
The most interesting thing about the candle industry is that the candles that are produced now are optimized along completely different axes than they were when they were essential for light. Nobody even cares how much light a candle gives off anymore. <laughs> it's completely secondary to the value of the candle. What you care about is what it says on it, how it smells, and if it's pretty, right? And the other thing about this, which I just, I, I, I always like to mention, is that the candle industry, right now, about 90% of all candle sales are made by women. Are, are made by women, you know, are purchased by women. And is that the future of books, perhaps? Is it going to be this kind of experiential romantic thing that, you know, the men are just grunt and ignore? You know, we're not sure. So, but candles are still a part of our society and there's still people making money in the candle business. But candles are a $2 billion industry in the U.S. Okay, and to give you an idea of what, what a $2 billion industry looks like, whale watching is a $2 billion industry in the U.S. <laughs> and Yu-Gi-Oh! is a $2 billion industry in the U.S. So is that the future of the print industry? Probably not immediately, but perhaps eventually. We'll talk more about that as we go. So we're at this point now where, everyone, everyone know who that is? Adlai Stevenson. Adlai Stevenson, very good. So we're at this point now where the technology is changing so quickly and there's such a sharp generational divide that it may be the case that for people who are now in elementary school, that when they reach adulthood, Someone who does this will look as ridiculous as someone who does this, <laughs> right? What's the difference? Collection of outmoded technology. You know, Adlai Stevenson and his, his egghead collection, the most famous intellectual of all, or Olaf from Norway who collects typewriters. I think his name's actually John, and he collects all kinds of really cool stuff, but this is his collection of Selectrics. And you look at this and you're like, what is his problem, <laughs> right? We might think the same way about someone who has a book collection, because what would be the point? So, what can libraries expect in this century? Let's try to spot some trends. The first thing is, is that we really need to be very aware of the difference between open markets and closed markets. For the most part, the book industry that currently exists is an open market. And if you ever have looked at any self-published books, it's abundantly clear that <laughs> there is an open market for books. Anyone can have something printed if they put their own money into it. But that's not a new thing either. Um, Bertrand Russell had to self-publish his first, the Principia Mathematica. He had to self-publish that at his own expense because nobody would, nobody would publish it. Turned out to be an immensely important work in the study of logic. And I learned that from a comic book. So <laughs> when you have this range between open markets and closed markets. Now, a closed market is the Kindle store or the app store. Those are closed markets in that you don't have complete access to them. And there's kind of a large, there's a spectrum. You know, it's not one or the other. Because to a certain extent, the App Store, the Apple App Store, is not the most closed market ever. Apple's in complete control of what's in their market, but they generally accept all comers. I don't know if you heard the story about the, there was a kid who, at his library, learned to write software and wrote a game called Bubble Ball, and it went to the top of the Apple charts. He, all he did was write it and submit it to Apple, and they approved it, and then it went to the top of the charts. Now, it helped that it was free, but... He learned to do that at his library. So in some essence, ess essences, it's an open market. But if you tried to write an app for the iPhone that gave free access to books from libraries, the Apple might not be quite so crazy about that. You know, it's, it depends on, on how, how it all works out. So the Kindle store is not a very open market, although anyone can self-publish on the Kindle store. It's a little bit bigger barrier to entry. The Android market, and I just think it's so awesome that we're here in the 21st century, literally talking about the pros and cons of Android markets. So, yeah, well, I'm talking about the phones. So Android markets or big box retailers are kind of somewhere in the middle. It's easier to get stuff into that store, but, you know, if you want to sell something at Best Buy and you invented something, you don't really have much luck. You know, it's, it's not quite the way. Flea markets are pretty open if you can get through the door. Garage sales are very open. eBay is extremely open that anyone can sell anything on eBay, and eBay staff isn't involved in that transaction. That's an important distinction to think about. eBay is a mesh company in that they connect the two endpoints of a transaction at essentially no cost to themselves. That's why it costs 10 cents to list something on eBay, and they make 9 cents on it or something like that. Anyway, and the web is kind of like the ultimate open market. 
All you got to do is put a computer in your basement and hook it up to a phone line and you can reach a global audience, right? So you have this spectrum between open markets and closed markets. Then we also have kind of this axis of what might happen in the future between is publishing going to thrive in the 21st century or is publishing going to die back as the other industries that have been wrapped around outmoded technologies have. And there's kind of, you know, you can envision kind of a spectrum there where publishing might not thrive, but they might survive. You'll see some consolidation, a couple big houses continue to make some money, or maybe it's like the status quo where it kind of just sits where it is for 15, 20 years. Maybe it hangs on tenaciously with a lot of consolidation, or maybe publishing really takes it on the chin. We see some massive layoffs, huge restructuring, uh, major houses being bought, by a, by, bought for a song by Chinese interests. Who knows? You know, there's all kinds of stuff that could happen. But I think the blacksmith knew that his choice was to adapt or to retire. You know, and I think that what we see now is publishing trying to adapt. Unfortunately, they're trying to adapt along the 20th century rules. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So let's do a little bit of scenario planning based on this. Is everyone familiar with this kind of method of doing scenario planning? So we have two, two variables. Libraries are not in control of either one of these things. Okay? Publishing could thrive or publishing could die back. Open markets could flourish or closed markets could dominate. So what happens in each one of these combinations? Well, if publishing thrives and closed markets survive, that's kind of where we're at right now, which would be kindly called the DRM dystopia. <laughs> Prices stay high because the publishers are in control of the price point, and you hear them talking all the time about that they can't survive if books cost less than $9.99. Well, ask Amanda Hawking how she's doing on books less than $9.99. You familiar with Amanda Hawking? She's a Kindle store uh, independent author. Whoops. Kindle store independent author, and she is selling uh, over 100,000 units a month on the Kindle store at 99 cents, $1.99, or $2.99, and she gets 70% of that take. There's not a publisher in the world that can make that deal, but she is trying traditional publishing as a lark. She said in her blog post, I'm going to try it and see what happens. I know I won't make as much money, but I might get some more readers. You know, so it's a different way of looking at it. So prices would stay high artificially. Lots of professional output, because we all know what publishers do extremely well is make a beautiful, high quality output, mostly. And then DRM everywhere. Everyone understand when I say DRM, what I mean digital rights management software that makes digital objects not behave digitally, essentially. <laughs> You'll have device exclusivity fights in that one of these publishers is going to say, hey, guess what? We're now exclusive to Kindle. Another one might say, hey, we're now exclusive to the iPad. Fight! You know, so who knows what's going to happen with that? But you will continue to have at libraries only intermediated deals, right? We can't buy digital content ourselves. We can only do it through intermediaries. And one thing, as we continue to talk about this, the internet is not typically kind to intermediaries. It does not like them. It routes around them. And the reality is libraries take what we can get in this scenario. This is kind of where we are. We're taking what we can get, and boy, are we ever taking it. Now, if publishing dies back, but closed markets survive, then we're talking about a world where there's the Kindle store and the App Store, but no HarperCollins and no Simon & Schuster and no Random House. This is where the maker of the device holds all the power. And we're pretty close there, but still they aren't in the content business for the most part. Yeah. Yet, exactly. App store price points, because while the publishing industry thinks that they can't survive at $9.99, Apple doesn't feel that way. Apple's making a killing 99 cents at a time, only taking 30% of that. Can you, and, and that's the other part of it, is that the equation is flipped. Apple is essentially getting the royalty, and the person who made the thing is getting the lion's share of the margin. That's a big difference. Now, one thing about closed markets is just because it's closed doesn't mean it's high quality. Look through the App Store to define that. There's tons of garbage in the App Store, because anyone can put something in the App Store, and there's no reason not to have thousands of things in the App Store, because someone might buy it. That's kind of like the DRM triumph scenario, where it's like DRM is a constant fact of everybody's life in that scenario. You'll see create creator exclusivity deals because the publishers will have fallen away from the equation. Where Apple will say, James Patterson, bring your next novel as an App Store exclusive. 
we'll pay you 20 million bucks. And he scratches his chin really hard. He says, hmm, that sounds like a good deal. The big problem with this is no more deals for libraries. None. Kindle's not selling to us. Apple's not selling to us. They don't believe that there's a place in their model for our, for our organizations. We have no recourse if they think that, except for a couple things. We'll talk about it. So in that situation, libraries have to find a new way to provide value to their communities, a completely different way that's not tied to subsidized access of commercial content. We'll get to that in a minute. Now let's get a little more optimistic. What if open markets flourish? Now I apologize for the extremely wordy slide, but there's, you know, there's a lot of nerdy stuff here. So what if publishing thrives in an open market setting? You might call that a neo-renaissance, where it's an explosion of publishing, an explosion of new content, all kinds of stuff available all over the place. And because it's an open market, someone can come in there and say, I, well, James Patterson could say, hey, here's my new bestseller, 99 cents. He will make a killing because he's going to sell more than 10 times as many units as then he did at 9.99, right? As soon as someone pricks that bubble, the cost of ebooks is going to collapse and with that per unit margin is the staff of most publishing houses you know they're not going to be able to employ 250 people on 99 cents a unit in this situation there's tons of pro output in that the publishers are making money on these open markets they're they're bringing all kinds of new stuff in there but they got to be doing it with significantly reduced staffs than they did before the biggest part of it is they don't have to mess with the print part you know, it's a lot less, while there is cost associated with producing an ebook, there's not paper, there's not trucking, there's not gasoline, there's not ink, there's not uh, plates and signatures and blades and workman's comp and all the sorts of things that go with that. In this situation, by definition, an open market has no DRM. Now, as a geek, of course, I have the opinion that DRM has no future. The reality is the rights holders can make it have a future. But DRM as an idea is something that young people are so entirely disinterested in that they will, it basically teaches them to steal. It teaches them to steal. And then, you know, when they don't see any reason not to, especially when their favorite artists are telling them to, please download my music for free. You know, it completely changes the way they think of the value of this. In that scenario, devices don't matter. It doesn't matter whether you have an iPod or a Kindle or, or you know, some type of brain implant. <laughs> Any sort of device will work because it's an open market. The content's not secured by DRM. It's something that you work with anywhere. In this case, libraries would need to maintain deals with lots of different publishers. Because if it's an open market we can, and there's no DRM, we can buy digital content. Actually buy it. Because this is in a scenario where the publishers have let go of the 20th century worries and realize the more people that are exposed to a thing, the more money they make, regardless of if they paid for the thing or not. We'll talk more about that as we go. And in that case, libs can actually buy. We can actually buy ebooks and distribute them to people. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So, one more scenario. What if publishing dies back and open markets thrive? Well, this is kind of like, you know, the, uh, the hacker's utopia of a free culture society where free is the dominant price for information. And you hear it from hackers all the time. Information wants to be free. Well, you know, it doesn't really want anything, but it could, would want that as much as it wants anything else. Um, in, a, in that sort of society, you have a really wide quality range. Look at the web. There's all kinds of stuff out there. You've got TimeCube at one end and Slate at the other. There's all kinds of wide content. But there would be no DRM or access barrier. If you wanted a piece of content, it would simply be the act of wanting it, and then you would have it. And it seems impossible to imagine, but the authors who are releasing their books for free are making more money than the ones that don't. When they give it away, they reach more people. And when they reach more people, they have a larger base of fans. And it's the fans that make you rich, not the sales. Uh, an excellent example of this is, um, familiar with the, the uh, almost 30-year-old rock band, They Might Be Giants. Um, they just yesterday announced a new program that they call their True Fan Program. And the first 1,000 people who pay them a one-time fee of $80 will receive a bunch of unique content, all digital downloads, a vinyl record with their stuff on it, and two free tickets to a They Might Be Giants show to be named later. That costs them almost nothing. They're gonna make 80 grand. They know about 
a thousand true fans. Have you ever heard that idea that all you need is a thousand true fans to make a living? Well, they might be giants to understand that. So, in this situation, devices of course still don't matter, but it's the death of the publisher deal because there's really no more publisher. There's really no more deal. There's no money changing hands. That doesn't mean that libraries can't collect and store stuff. For a library to have a collection that it shares with its users will still have value in this even on the web because your library can select the things that your community is interested in. Libraries are local. It's an advantage we have over almost any other business. Your best buy up the street doesn't care what your community's into. It only cares what your community buys. Where at the library, we can be reactive to community needs and get things that are specific to our community. So, let's look at each one of these in a little bit more detail and what libraries will need to adapt to these situations. So here's where we're at right now, DRM Dystopia. We take what we can get. We have few and sometimes only one supplier. It's not really a big deal managing, I mean, we don't have to worry about managing lots of business relationships. It's basically Baker and Taylor, you know, or Overdrive, you know, those are, those are your choices essentially. But the problem is, in the digital realm, we have no power to make deals, right? And the whole recent events have made that abundantly clear. The tables at which these deals are being made, there's not a library representative there because libraries don't really have an economic interest in that. It's a transaction between a rights holder and a distributor. No more do we have a place in that than we should be dictating to Baker and Taylor what they're getting when they are buying content from a publisher. In this situation, and we've seen this abundantly clear, libraries pay more and get less because the rights holders are setting the price and they have the ability to set the price. So, Libraries either find supplemental value, otherwise other ways to provide value to your community, or alternate revenue streams, or, you know, those are pretty much the choices in this sort of scenario, which is part of why you see so, many, so much talk on the blogosphere about how troubling the recent events have been, because it is pointing in a very bad direction for libraries, especially public libraries. So let's look at publishing dieback in the closed market. Libraries need to find a new way especially in the business when everyone who's reading best-selling fiction is getting it through a store that won't sell to libraries, right? And this has kind of already happened. Um, uh, let's see, um, the, the Immortal, The Short Second Life of Brie Tanner, it was a novella in the Eclipse of Stephanie Meyer thing. It first came out as a Kindle exclusive. It was later available in print, but there was a day when we got a teen coming into our library and saying, Stephanie Meyer has a new book, do you guys have it? And we looked, it's like Kindle exclusive, and it's like, sorry, it's not for sale to us. That's never happened to libraries before. We've never been in a situation where we want to buy something and it's not for sale to us. But that's the canary in the coal mine. There's going to be a lot more of that. So in a situation where libraries cannot buy materials, what do we focus on? Well, we'll talk more about this later, but we'll focus on helping our patrons to create their own content storing their content, and becoming that repository for the information of the community. What about if publishing thrives in an open market, the neo, the neo renaissance? In this case, libraries would be, would be able to buy and distribute stuff from all kinds of people because you're paying them and they'll give you the file because no library, if the file is floating around out there on the web, no library is going to take it and then give it to their patrons without paying the person originally. You know, if the, person, if the author is offering it for sale, a library is going to want to give them some money, right? Because we want to keep the whole thing moving. So, but that might mean that instead of having three important business relationships, you might have 30,000 important business relationships. And uh, any catalogers in the, or acquisitions people in the room? I'm, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a harrowing thought, managing 30,000. I mean, it's pretty tough just dealing with Midwest Tape or any of the, you know, the, the, the businesses that are even experts in this. These are extremely complex deals. If complex deals, you read that as lots of billable hours involved, right? <laughs> lots of attorneys. We're not going to be able to get through this next century without lots of billable hours because the Copyright Act is a long way from being revised. The 1976 uh, revision of the Copyright Act was a very big deal, added lots of really important stuff, but it was also 1976. And uh, there's a great article by Jessica Littman called the Copyright Revision Act of 2026. And she has an outstanding vision and she makes the point that each one of the major copyright revisions over time has taken about 20 years to happen. 
So it's a long way before there's going to be any sort of legislative relief for any of this stuff. And frankly, the direction things are going now, I don't think we want Congress to act on this, <laughs> right? Because we're not going to come out ahead on that deal. Most important thing here is what libraries would need in this situation is storage and distribution infrastructure. It's not rocket science. You buy a Drobo or some kind of a big server. You hire one geek. <laughs> they can make it happen. We tend to look for paid solutions in our industry. Well, we're not going to be able to buy our way out of the 21st century. We have to invent it. And that means hiring a geek, a programmer, and not one that the city or the county approved because they don't know what good programmers are, right? Can you tell I work in this industry? Yeah, all right. So libraries need distribution infrastructure. In the free culture society, libraries collect and store all kinds of stuff. Anything that your patrons might want, it's there for anyone, so why not grab a copy of it and have it on your server so you can keep it safe and keep access to it forever? Because we all know what happens on the web, great things disappear, right? They're up there and they disappear. Well, you know, libraries have been really good at keeping stuff from disappearing. It's one of our great values is we collect stuff and we keep it so our people can have it. If someone's distributing their book for free on the web, why can't the library take a copy and put it on its own server, put it in the catalog system so someone's finding it, can download it right then. No client installed, no Windows update required, you just download it and look at it right there. Simple deals, because in many cases no money changes hands. But again, libraries need storage and distribution infrastructure. We need big servers and geeks to take care of them. So, what to do now? And I think we saw this, in three of those four scenarios, libraries need storage infrastructure and the geeks to tend to them. And of course, for libraries of all size, I always get the question, well, what are we going to cut to be able to hire a geek? Well, I'll tell you, you're going to cut reference staff. <laughs> reference is dead. Reference died in 1993. Okay? It's, it's been on life support since then. What happened in 1993? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just picking a date, you know? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, she pierced the veil. All right, so um, the, the reality is that a web native who has good customer service skills can do an outstanding job on the reference desk no matter what degree they have, right? And part of, you know, if librarians are professionals, and even though I'm not a librarian, I feel completely that librarians are professionals, why do we treat them like they're cashiers, right? Because when you go to the doctor's office, there's not a doctor sitting there to greet you. Everyone you deal with at every desk is not a doctor. The doctor is too expensive and valuable to sit there telling you where the bathroom is six times an hour, right? If they're professionals, they should be behind the scenes and their time should be spent carefully and you can, make, you can get a lot of savings by staffing with a different level of support at the reference desk. Part of the reason that my library has been able to do some of the things that we have is that we made this decision 10 years ago. And we've been hiring geeks. When, we, when I started at the library, this was reference and this was IT and now it's like this. And it's because IT is where the future is. And the whole notion of reference, well, it's like we're still providing travel agents. You know, is, is not anyone going to travel agent school these days? You know, travel agents were outmoded because the people felt that they had the better access to the information than they could get from the Travel Agents Commission. We're in a similar sort of spot. We all know that trained librarians can add a huge amount of value to a, a, a reference interaction, right? But the user doesn't feel that way. We can't make them feel that way. We can't market that into them. Because when they go to Google and they type in three words, they find something that they think helps them. And if they think that, who are we to argue? So that's where the resources can come from, by staffing your desks with a different type of staff. I actually have in my department two librarians and their title is production librarian. They work on the desk four hours a week, you know, covering lunches or something like that. All the rest of their time, they're making projects, doing digitization work, organizing web pages, doing librarian work. And reference just ain't where it's at anymore. So that's my soapbox moment on reference and move on from that. So, we need to have the storage infrastructure and the geeks to tend it, and that means geeks who work for you, not for your vendor. 
Whatever money you have, you'll get more out of a local hire than you will by signing a contract. Okay, here's an example. So at my library, we looked at all this stuff. Anybody do Freegal? Okay. We looked at Freegal and we're like, no. The problem with Freegal is that it stays a steady value as the more it's used. The, same, the, the more it's used, it still costs the same per use. Library economics work when the more it's used, the less it costs per use, right? So what we did is we went and we worked, made a deal with this company called Magnatune. Magnatune is an online record label. They up the ante. Their slogan is not, don't be evil, but we are not evil. <laughs> and what Magnatune exists to do is to purchase and distribute online music licenses from a lot of different bands and they very carefully curate their collection. These are the genres that they cover, these 10 genres, but they, they got a little something for everything in there and their collection is about 900 albums and five more every week. We made a deal with them, we say we'll, we'll pay you a flat annual fee and in return we're going to take all your music and put it on our servers in our catalog so people can download it unlimited, no DRM, use it immediately. That's the model. So here's what it looks like. On our catalog, you search for music and you find these, you find albums, just like anything else. You click through to it and there it says download MP3 album. You click the button, the download begins. You're done. There's no client, there's no Windows update involved. Or you can download each one of the tracks or you can stream it right there. The economics of this worked because we were able to make a deal with Magnitude that was more revenue than they, would actually, than they would otherwise expect to receive from our service area because they'll sell you the same stuff as to an individual for 15 bucks a month. Okay, So we made a deal with them where we're paying them an annual fee greater than what they would realistically expect to get from our service area and we're giving to our patrons something that is worth $15 a month they can realize a return on their investment of their tax money without even coming into the library a single time. Right? 15 times 12, that's more than they're paying us in taxes in a year. So that's already, even, and then if, gosh, if they, then if they actually use the library collections, it's just bonus on top of that. This is what happens when you have geeks and you have infrastructure. The most complex part of this was the legal stuff. The software part was easy. One of my guys put this together in two weeks. We didn't buy something. It was all open source technology. All we had to do was graft a couple things together and it's in our catalog right alongside anything else and you can just download it. So that's the type of thing that you can do now in that starting to think about how you structure the resources of your organization to be ready to take advantage of these kinds of opportunities. And you know, it's not a fast process because it has to be a slow transition. And realistically, most change in this, bin in this business is driven by retirements. So you gotta wait for the retirements to come along and then when that retirement comes along, you don't necessarily replace it with the same exact thing, right? Every retirement is a chance to innovate. And it's not because the people who retired weren't innovative. The people who retired were doing excellent, amazing work. But it's an opportunity to restructure. So what to do later is to make deals directly with rights holders. Not with publishers, not with intermediaries, not with distributors, but with rights holders. Like Magnatune, like Amanda Hawking. Why can't a library contact Amanda Hawking and say, hi, we'll give you five grand for unlimited access for all your stuff. And you, that could be in perpetuity or maybe you give them a thousand dollars a year or something like that. So let's look at that, those economics a little bit more closely. Okay, so I'm going to make some assumptions here to keep these economic things kind of graspable. Let's look at books and how authors make money from books, okay? Let's assume three dollar royalty per copy sold. Most authors should be so lucky, but that's, that's a, a kind of a safe middle of the road number, assuming that they earned back their advance, assuming that they're not, that's after the agent's cut, all that kind of stuff. So, if we also assume an even distribution of purchases of that material across the entire US, a blockbuster will sell five million books. You know, they print, uh, Dan Brown's most recent turd, they printed five million things up front, okay? That's how much they thought was gonna sell, all right? That's an income for Dan Brown of a nickel per American, okay? Five cents per American. A bestseller could sell 500,000 copies going down one order of magnitude. 
Oh, magnitude. Magnitude. One order of magnitude down. A bestseller of 500,000 copies, that's half a nickel. Or no, that's half a cent per person. A breakout hit, 50,000 50, copies. And most authors should be so lucky to ever have something in their life that sells 50,000 copies. That works out to 0 0.0005 cents per person. Or a sleeper hit, something that's 5,000 copies, you know? Or maybe something niche like, a, you know, an ALA editions book. They don't ever, no, no, I'm not, no, it's, that's, that's their audience. You know, a big hit for ALA editions is two or 3,000 copies. That's their audience. It's also why they cost 40 bucks. So 5,000 copies equals 0 0.00005 cents per person, okay? That's how much the author is making. So let's assume then, a service area of 250,000 people. Okay, so that's a pretty good sized city. It's not a small community, but it's not a huge one either. So that means for a service population of 250,000 persons, the blockbuster author makes $12,500 from that community. The bestseller, 1250, the breakout, 125, and the sleeper, 1250. Okay, so we're just going up and down one order of magnitude. Magnitude! Okay. <laughs> now, Assuming a library discounted cost of $20 per copy, because one of the things that's great about our, our relationships with all of our vendors is libraries don't pay retail for anything. You know, so when we, when we buy, we buy at a good price. Now, but that's also assuming our cost to intake it, our cost to get it out, those kinds of things, okay? So, a blockbuster that made $12,500 in sales to a community of 250,000 people, it's the same amount of money as a library buying 625 copies of that. The same amount, uh, that's how much money we're spending. A library is, can buy 625 copies for $12,500, okay? 62 copies for $12,50, and so on and so forth. Now, very few libraries buy 600 copies of anything, except for the super huge ones. But, a library in a town of 250,000 people will routinely buy 62 copies of something. If it's hot, if it's a big thing, it's a bestseller. Of course you got 62 copies. 250,000 people, you probably have six branches or something like that. You're buying 62 copies of that. That means you're already investing more in buying the stuff than the author is making and there's the opportunity. Especially at the breakout or the sleeper. We'll get to that in just a minute. So what this means is that a library could conceivably say, we were gonna spend 1250 on this anyway. We were gonna spend 1250 bucks to buy 62 copies of your book. Instead, We'll just give you $1,250, because that's retail, well, that's wholesale, that's the price that we're paying. That's not the author's cut. So that's more money than they would make by selling it through the channels. So the library could say, hey, we're gonna cut out both the middlemen, we wanna make a deal with you, rights holder, and we're gonna give you more money than you would otherwise make from our market. We spend about as much money as we're accustomed to doing, and who loses out? The publisher, the middlemen. We're cutting them out. We're doing it before the internet does it, right? Or even on the sleeper. You know, if you have like a niche title, it's gonna be interesting. You know, that person basically has no expectation they're gonna make any money ever from anyone. So you can come in and say, hey, we'll give you a hundred bucks. They're like, hey, I can eat this week, you know? So there's a lot of opportunity economically for libraries to make deals with rights holders that are advantageous to the rights holder, advantageous to the patron, advantageous to the library. The catch is, there's a transaction cost problem. Because this means we have to maintain relationships with 3,000 or 30,000 people. But what if there's a new mesh network, a new type of business like eBay, that allows you to put together people who want to sell to libraries and libraries who want to buy stuff, and they make not 70% of that transaction, but 3% on that transaction, like eBay or uh, PayPal do, you know? That's, there's a place for that. PayPal is a very profitable business. Now they have high risk because they're, a subs, they're liable for fraud. And that might be a nice thing. If they only sell, if they only do business with POs, they're not gonna have to worry about fraud too much. You know, we're good for the money in libraries. It's one thing that you can typically say. All right, so this is a huge opportunity for libraries to be able to do this, but it takes a completely different type of technology, software, and political infrastructure. Because part of the thing is, you might be paying this for a license in perpetuity, or you might be paying this for a, one, a yearly license. But really, you know, especially at public libraries, after the, after the demand curve spikes, we don't need that many copies of it. You know, the other part of it is that we recently found by analyzing our hold data, 
We looked at a million holds, which is about what we do in one year. And out of those million holds, only 10% of them were on hot items. The majority of them were not on hot items. Are we throwing only 10% of our money at those hot items? No way. You know, we're throwing a lot of money at those hot items. So you might say, one way of looking at it, is our libraries disenfranchising the majority of their communities that want all kinds of weird stuff in pursuit of having enough copies for the blockbuster reader who just wants to read whatever's number one on the bestseller list or whatever Oprah told them to read this week. Okay? So there's a lot of opportunity for ways to change the library. But there's an Achilles heel to this whole scheme. One day, you know, we talked about the bubble bursting down to 99 cents. Well, it can go further than that. What if one day James Patterson says, you know what? I'm going to give this away for free. Brought to you by Speedo. <laughs> Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he do this? Well, and of course, we all love to beat up on James Patterson, but the fact is, he knows how to sell books. He knows how to sell books. He knows what he's doing. And, or even not with this, what if he put his next book free on the web with Google ads alongside every page? He would make a killing. And nobody at Little Brown has to see a dime of it if he doesn't want them to. In the world of free bestsellers, the problem of bestsellers at the library is kind of solved for us. Because nobody needs the library anymore to get bestsellers. So then the mission of the library becomes all the stuff that's not the bestsellers. Selecting the stuff that your community is interested in. It's what we've been doing for years. Selecting the best stuff.